it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Janice Kavanagh Resnick, who's going to be talking to us about Jewish World Watch 20 years later. Can't believe it's been 20 years. A little bit about Janice. Many of you know her. Um, she practiced environmental law for 25 years before leaving her law practice to start Jewish World Watch with Rabbi Schulweis. More recently, she's established Jews United for Democracy and Justice, which provides a weekly virtual town hall series on Wednesdays and other days um, at, uh, called America at a Crossroads, which focuses on combating anti-democratic forces in the U.S. and encouraging pro-democracy civic engagement. Janice, welcome back to VBS. We look forward to welcoming you. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. It's great to be here. I know almost everybody in the room, and if I didn't know you before, I really appreciate those of you who've come up and tell me that, and have told me that you watch our programs on Wednesdays and some other nights of the week on a completely different subject. I mean, I'm sure we could find some connection between them. Uh, I was supposed to be here in October, um, uh, the week after, I think it was, I mean, Joel will have to tell me, I think it was October 15th or... You were October 9th, you 9th, were scheduled. Okay. So October 7th happened and... And I called Joel and I said, uh, and you'll hear how October 7th really influenced uh, this organization. And as your last speaker said, and I thought it was such a fascinating hour, um, October 7th, I think it's such a monumental day in the life of the Jewish people, um, that it, it has an enormous impact on a lot of organizations, and not the least of which was Jewish World Watch. So I'll tell you more about that as we go on. I, I also want to tell Joel and the other volunteers who put together Hazak for so many years, I know how much work it is to do a weekly program, and how much planning, and how much coordination. So kol kavod, thank you for doing that for our community. And um, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of decisions, a lot of time, uh, all volunteer. And uh, you're speaking to somebody who really understands what that means. So thank you very much for that. And thanks for inviting me and for finding this alternative date. Serena Oberstein, who was our executive director for about the last five years, was supposed to be here with me. But some of you, especially those of you who live in the North Valley, may know that she's running uh, for city council. And so when she began her career, I mean, her campaign, uh, earlier this year, she left Jewish World Watch. So she's not here because it would be a conflict of interest for her to be speaking on behalf of the organization while she is running in a competitive election. Um, so I am here by myself. We're in the middle of a very big transition uh, at Jewish World Watch looking for a, um, a new executive director and doing some very serious strategic planning. So right now you have me, and I'm actually in a very good position to talk about the history of Jewish World Watch, and that's what I'm gonna focus on for the first part of this presentation, more than uh, the places we work and the conflicts in the world, which I'll get to at the end. Um, but how many of you were here in 2004 when Rabbi Schulweis first proposed Jewish World Watch? Quite, quite a few of you. Um, it was it was in um, it was on Rosh Hashanah in two, in 2004 that Rabbi Schulweis of blessed memory um, gave a remarkable sermon that is on our website. Um, but his idea was to put Judaism and this was always his idea for so many different projects, putting the words of the Torah into action and not just having them be words you recite and you know, sort of empty, empty vows and empty language, but to actually take the words of the Torah and put them into action. And um, that, this was one of many of his brilliant ideas to do that. At the time, and you know, Rabbi Sholas went through his entire life without so much as touching a computer. So you know, he, he knew what was going on though in the world. He was an avid reader. He understood the impact and implications of the news he read and the magazine articles he read um, so, and the people he spoke with. So he heard about the genocide going on in Darfur and that caused him to reflect on, you know, what, how should a Jew react to those sorts of things? He then told the story, and part of his sermon was about what happened during the Holocaust, how, what he wanted people to, to do, and what we Jews fantasize about, if only, if only the church had done this, if only 
the people who weren't Jewish would have stood up and done something. Um, and then he also recognized, while he didn't know how many genocides there were since the Holocaust, since we adopted the words never again, it turns out there were about 50 or 60 Holocaust between, I mean, genocides between the Holocaust and Darfur. But um, he was very well aware of many of those, the ones that are uh, most well known. I'll just take the Rwanda genocide as an example. He felt the Jewish community had not responded the way we are saying that people should have responded to our genocide, to our Holocaust. So that's what got him uh, to compose his sermon and to suggest that we begin a mobilization effort directed at genocides going on in the world. And these are just little sentences that I drew from, um, from that sermon. That sermon, I'm sure, is on the Showweiss Institute website, right, Bill, with all the other sermons. It was uh, Rosh Hashanah 2004, if you wanted to read it. Um, and these are the, con the main concepts that I pulled. Now, the interesting thing, especially in light of October 7th, and I'll give you a second just to reflect on some of those sentences, uh, is for the 50 years after the Holocaust, and Rabbi Feinstein made this point to me uh, on October 9th or 10th, I, I saw him and I said, this is just so horrible. We're feeling so vulnerable as the anti-Semitic. I mean, the first three or four days, we did not, we were just in shock about what happened in Israel. And then as the anti-Semitism, it must have been towards the end of October when the anti-Semitism in the world began, I said, this is just so weird. Everybody's feeling so insecure. You don't know what people are going to say to you on the streets. People are taking off their mug in David. Uh, taking the, I mean, you, you heard stories of people really being anxious, and we all felt that way as well. And what Rabbi Feinstein said to me, and it does bear on this story, is what you're feeling now is what Jews have felt in most of history. He says, this is not a... This is not a new idea that Jews feel insecure, anxious, not knowing what people are going to say to you and not um, and expecting to be treated uh, with, with a, a certain kind of anti-Semitism, whether it was subsurface or above the surface, whatever, um, whatever the particular era was. But he said, he said that to me, and it really got me to thinking that we... Those of us who, I mean, ev almost everybody in this room, everybody in this room, most of their life was post-Holocaust. And uh, it was sort of a bubble in the American Jewish community and in the world Jewish community. In fact, even, you know, if, if you're involved Jewishly, you know that while the ADL continued to thrive during, of course, during the post-Holocaust years, um, many, it was very different than it is now when you see a huge focus on combating anti-Semitism in a much more dramatic way. Everything has, has escalated to a, to a point that most of us were unfamiliar with. When Rabbi Showwise proposed Jewish World Watch, there were very few Jewish communities in the world that were really seriously at risk. And that is a hard thing for us to fathom now. Many organizations, I mean, if you even think about the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which was a very old, old organization that whose job was to resettle ref, Jewish refugees around the world. Starting about 30 years ago, they completely re-envisioned their mission because Jews, after the, after the Russian, huge Russian Jewish migration to Israel, after that there were not huge segments of Jews anywhere in the world that were migrating, and they actually repositioned themselves to be a refugee relief organization. So they are working in many of the same places that Jewish World Watch is. We fund at Jewish World Watch, we fund many of Hyas's projects in the places we live. And that's just sort of a symbol of the fact that they had to repurpose themselves because Jews were not in trouble in the world for a 50 or 60 year period, like we are now very much on the edge of our seats, not knowing really how this is gonna all iron out. The anti-Zionism, which easily morphs into anti-Semitism, and the precarious position of Israel, and the huge uh, onslaught on college campuses of anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. And I do separate those because, because there probably is some kind of a distinction, but there is certainly, a, on campuses, a lot of that anti-Zionism is, uh, is, is just intimidating Jewish students and making them feel extremely uncomfortable to identify Jewishly. 
and that has created a, a very big problem for Jewish World Watch because most of our work is a lot of our out there work was done on college campuses. So let's talk about what's happened over the last 20 years. So we always had a three-part mission. We wanted to educate people about genocides. We wanted to activate people for, uh, and, and be able to advocate in legislative forums to be able to change policy. And we wanted to provide direct uh, relief to victims and survivors of genocide and mass atrocity. And we developed, over the, for the first four or five years, we really focused on the Darfur genocide, which started in 2003, and really on and off lasted until 2020. I mean, the five or 600,000 people were killed in the first few years of that genocide. But the, the killing was intermittent over a 20, over the entire life of our organization. It stopped in 2020, but then started again in, 2020, in 2022. So there's a new uh, onslaught against the Darfuris. Um, so when we, um, when we began, it was really focused on Darfur, but as we became a more, um, a more established organization, we added four or five other, as horrible conflicts in the world began, we added different conflicts to our mission as we were able. We never abandoned the people that we served in the Chadian refugee camps, which were the Darfuri refugees. About six or 700,000 of them fled to neighboring Chad, and that was where we connected. I visited those refugee camps um, uh, twice. Um, that's, I could tell you stories about, about life in a Chadian refugee camp, um, but that would take a lot of time. But if you have questions about that, um, or my 10 trips to Eastern Congo, we can talk about that at any time. Those were really amazing, uh, eye-opening experiences. So from Darfur, we extended to Congo, where there was Eastern Congo. There's about 100 different militias fighting, um, and it's really difficult to tell who's right and who's wrong, because it's not just one party, the bad guys against the good guys. It's a lot of really bad players, and there's very few really good players, and it's really a mess in that country. Um, we work with rape victims and children, uh, children of rape and rape survivors, and uh, in certain instances with children in communities that have been heavily uh, targeted by these militia groups. Uh, so that's a second area. Then we began to take on as advocates various other problems in the world uh, that we couldn't actually affect what was going on on the ground, like the Uyghur situation, and I can talk, I'm gonna tell you more substantively about that later. Um, we decided to become core advocates um, in behalf of the Uyghur population, which is a Muslim ethnic group in northern, northwest China um, that is remarkably, uh, it, they've been in that area for thousands of years, literally, and they're being targeted with uh, forced assimilation and forced labor, slave labor, and killings. So we can talk about that. We've been able to be a major, uh, major player in passing certain kinds of legislation because 80% of the world's cotton comes from, or 50%, I forget exactly the number, a lot of the world's cotton comes from that region in China. And uh, right now the Uyghurs are being forced to process that cotton. So we've targeted those companies um, that are using those products, uh, those cottons, and we have helped to pass legislation uh, which makes it, uh, really bans the import of, of products made with forced Uyghur labor. So we did that kind of advocacy. We did a lot of advocacy in Congo. In Congo, it's a very mineral rich country where you get the tin, tantalum, and tungsten, the three Ts. Um, it's, it's like 50% of the world's supply of these, of these minerals. And these minerals are used to make cell phones and uh, all the electronic devices. So um, we, we had several campaigns aimed, aimed at trying to uh, ban companies from using um, products that were mined by, uh, by slave labor. I actually visited one of those mining areas and it was just shocking. They have completely unreinforced mines and <clears throat> they just dig these big holes and put children in them to take bucket by bucket the, the, the dirt out and the kids stand on top of each other. You can get like 20 kids standing on top of each other's shoulders, passing the buckets up. Um, it's, it's just shocking to, when you see that and realize that all of our devices, um, in a way, we're all, you know, we're all feeding that slave market. 
um, very, very dangerous with these children that have been more or less thrown out by society uh, because they have no fathers, they have the mothers often reject the children of rape, and those are the ones that they force into these camps and have them um, doing this really, really horrible work um, that you know we all benefit from. So our goal was to try to uh, alert people. We worked with Intel, a very large company. They were the first company that, with our urging that agreed not to use minerals that come from those mines. And we, our job was to identify which mines had these uh, horrible conditions with the children that were being exploited. So that's the kind of advocacy we did. We've been able to pass some legislation at the federal level, but we did a lot of work with individual companies, and we have a database of different companies and the products they're using, whether it's the Uyghurs or uh, the minerals that were uh, illicitly mined. Um, and that's th that was what we built over the years, that kind of advocacy agenda. And then our direct service projects, um, and the reason we traveled, by the way, small teams of people travel to these places, is we really wanted to work with local nonprofits in those villages. And we didn't want to just give our money to some big international organization that was then, you know, going to tell, tell us what was important. But we wanted to hear it. We, we thought we'd make more of an impact if we went into, we weren't going to have a huge amount of money. Um, so we wanted to see if we could spend our money in a way that would be high impact. So when we'd go and travel, we would make meetings. We'd, for, you know, we'd sort of, it took us a few trips to find people we trusted, get to know them, get to know the work they do, make sure they had computer abilities to be able to connect with us, send photographs to us, talk to us on the phone. Um, and ultimately we found really good people and we were able to fund with our relative, relatively small amount of money, I think we've spent about $10 million over the last 20 years investing in these projects. Um, we've been able to really make an impact on literally hundreds of thousands of people um, through these very sort of micro projects um, that we um, found very meaningful for the people there. And also, we. The, the other part of the equation, and I think for Rabbi Scholweis it was actually the more important part of the equation, was what are we doing here to be able to elevate consciousness, mostly in children? One of Rabbi Scholweis's, for those of you who knew him well, he, he really was becoming increasingly frustrated with the self-absorption self of American society, the commercialism, everybody being so sort of involved with themselves and the the big parties and all the glamour and glitz. And he was concerned, I think, that people, American Jews, would fall into that trap of sort of just becoming the narcissistic American. And one of his agendas was to interpret Judaism to young people in a way that would excite them and enthuse them and have them think bigger about what their role is in the world. Um, so that was really important to us. As we developed our projects, we wanted to make them attractive for young people to engage with them. So in a minute I'll tell you, many of you may have heard about, we had a very successful project that lasted about 10 years until it was, um, for reasons unrelated to us, it became uh, impractical. But it was called the Solar Cooker Project. And it was a project that was designed um, to protect women in Congo from being raped when they went out to get firewood. And um, what would happen was these refugee camps where they were living in Chad, they were like 80% women and children, 80, 90, very few men were at the camps. So the women, and of course there's no electricity, there's no technology at all, there's nothing. I mean, this, this, is, this is really in the middle of nowhere. All there is for hundreds, maybe thousands of miles of sand. So they would have to go uh, send their kids out because they would have a lot of kids. In these refugee camps, these women had seven or eight children of their own, and then for all the women that died, they would take on the other children. So often, they were living with responsible for 12, 13 kids. So they could, I mean, and their whole day was spent just trying to make sure people would survive, I mean, to eat, because the food rations were small. They got smaller over the years as the whole situation in Syria and other countries grew the number of refugees. So, of course, as time went on, it got worse and worse for the old refugees who had been in their camps for a long time. So these women would have to send their daughters out to go get firewood. Um, whoever the oldest child was in the family would have to go get firewood, and they would bring 
uh, loads of firewood back, but on the way they would, and they, and they knew that it was very likely that their daughters would be raped, and many of them were. Uh, but this was sort of the price they were paying to be able to feed their families. And so we came up with this idea through a California company that did really simple solar cookers. It was a very simple cardboard with aluminum foil over it, a very, very rudimentary uh, but effective solar cooker. And we, we went to the refugee camps and we were able to work with this amazing man who came from the Netherlands. And he was a, 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 a just a, 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 a what, what's the word? Um, he was a, a, just an amazing humanitarian. He wasn't a wealthy man, but he was willing to give his time in this part of the world to help manage some of these projects. So we worked with him to actually build a, a manufacturing plant and very low tech. There's, as I said, this is you know, no no uh, electricity, and to hire the women, we paid to, to, for these women to make these solar cookers, and we trained them, and we brought somebody from the company in California who had who had patented and designed the solar cooker. They were willing to let uh, to, to train these women to do it, and we had a, a crew of about 50, 60 women who were actually making the solar cookers. We had another crew of women teaching people how to use them. And we were able to reduce the incidence of rape during that 10 years dramatically in the two refugee camps we worked in. And oddly enough, without any intention of doing so, we ended up creating what at the time was the largest contiguous so, um, solar cooker project in the world. Um, because this is the difference between how Jewish World Watch did things and other companies, other nonprofits. Everybody else would go to the UN looking for big, huge grants. And the big, huge grants, there's lobbyists, there's all kinds of people who lobby the UN for big money. And then there's for-profit companies that want to sell their fancy solar cookers, the kind that cost 50 or 60 or $70 a piece. Um, and they, they design these projects that are really expensive and don't, don't, uh, they're not economic development projects within the refugee camps. They're just sort of selling these cookers, and they don't have a training staff. So they would dump, you know, hundred thousand dollars worth of metal, complicated solar cookers that none of us would know how to use either, into a refugee camp, and they would just be sitting there. We saw stacks and piles of expensive, um, expensive types of, of metal uh, cookers. But ours was ours. We wanted to do it as an economic development project. We wanted to do it inexpensively. I did go to the UN, we went to uh, the UN on two occasions, once in New York and once in Geneva. They were very interested in our project but would not fund it because we didn't have a machine behind us lobbying for it and, and nobody was going to make any money off of it. So I, I mean, I hate to sound so cynical, but I did get the sense with the UN that the only things that you really can get funding for are big expensive things where there are companies behind it and lobbyists pushing for it. Well, that wasn't our style, it wasn't what we were doing, but that project lasted a very long time for like $25 a donation, somebody could actually underwrite a solar cooker, and, there, and it's basically money going into the refugee camps also to help the women um, create whatever kind of life they can create, which isn't much, but it was better than it was before. So. Um, that was the kind of projects, and we have a lot of pro. We we did a really interesting gardening. Oh, here the, here are our cookers. They're just pieces of cardboard, and that's one of the my trips in the Iridimi refugee camp. Um, so it's, it's quite simple. And these are the women in the in the plant in the uh, factory. You can see back there the stack of our cookers, um, and it was a great project. Which we had a real relationship with most of these women. And we would go every year, sometimes twice in a year, uh, a small group of us would go and meet with them and see how it's going to make sure. We also had a number of education projects. Um, and this, by the way, is both in, um, in, in the Chadian camps as well as in Congo. One of our big focuses, uh, FOSI, was education projects. Because in, while education is mandatory, for example, in Congo, it's a law that all kids need to go to school, but it's an unfunded mandate. So you, you're mandated to go to school, but your family has to pay for it, and most of these people are poor. I mean, you don't know what poor is until you've been to these villages. I mean, they have nothing, and they have a ton of kids. So they, maybe they can afford to send one to school, and then it's usually the oldest boy. 
So a lot of our projects funded girls going to school. It would take a girl, like if you look at a fourth grade, let's say a fourth grade class, um, and this is true in, in both environments, in both Chad and Congo, because they have certain similarities. Although the, the refugees from Chad were all Muslim, and Congo's a Christian country, so there's some fundamental political differences, and the conflicts are completely different, but one thing that was similar um, was if you go into a fourth grade class, or the boys are, are, look the same size as our boys here in the fourth grade, which is, you know, little. They're little boys, like this high. The girls are all 16 years old because it took them twice as long to be able to get to the fourth grade because they also had to go out and get the firewood. They had to do the cooking. They had to help their mother with caring for the younger babies. And everything fell on the girls. So the girls either got no education or a delayed education. So that... Um, that th these projects that help little girls go to school and alleviated, uh, we paid their tuition, but we mandated that it be a girl in the family instead of a boy, were really important to help equalize things. Um, one of the other incredible projects um, that we did was with Dr. Dr. McQuaggy. Dr. Dennis McQuaggy got the Nobel Peace Prize two years ago. And about 20, right in the beginning of Jewish World Watch, we connected with him at a hospital called Pansy Hospital in Congo. This was like our third or fourth year when we first began working in Congo. And he was really taken with our button. We came into the hospital with our buttons, which said, do not stand idly by, which, of course, was our sort of our theme for Jewish World Watch from the beginning was about not standing idly by. And he didn't know who we were, but he really liked that. Most of the people, I mean, Dr. McQuaggy is a gynecologist OB, and he is the most, obviously, he got the Nobel Peace Prize, so you know he's quite a remarkable person, but he dedicated his life to survivors of rape in Congo, and he took his family's money, whatever money they had, and built a hospital specifically for rape victims and for their children. And for the ch a lot of the children were children of rape. And he had a whole psychosocial program to be able to help the women accept their babies uh, and to help the women deal with all the ambivalence that women must feel um, when they are caring and deliver a child that was the product of such violence uh, and such enmity. Um, but he is remarkable. We funded a child care unit at his facility. We funded a sewing project. We did a lot of economic development projects with Dr. Pansy, with whom we stayed close over the years. And uh, he did actually run for, he, he himself has been the target of many assassination attempts in East, Eastern Congo. This is a place that there's like 100 different militias. And it's a very, very dangerous place. In fact, we haven't traveled to the parts that we work in for over five years because it's become extremely dangerous for us to travel either to the Chadian camps because now they're in a new a new war there or into Congo. These are just some of our advocacy. By the way, if anybody has questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm not formal and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. We had 15 walks over the years. Of course, the other thing that was really hard on Jewish World Watch was COVID, because most of our programs were in person, at schools, doing rallies, doing demonstrations, going into schools, taking kids to the city council to be able to speak and learn how to advocate. And that was the really the thrust of our local programming was the Jewish day schools, uh, Hebrew schools, and many of the non-Jewish uh, high schools, private, private schools. And um, we had teams from all over the place coming to the walk, and we have to work all year long with them. So it, what, people don't just show up at a walk to end genocide. It's sort of an obscure topic for people. It's very distant. They don't feel any connection to genocides in the world, most people. So we worked all year long to be able to go to schools, educate kids, engage them, and then they would put together one of the ways they would be able to show that they got it was putting together a walk team and coming to our walk. Um, and that was a big part of our work. That stopped five years ago, um, which has been a big blow to the organization. It's really difficult for us to do our work uh, remotely. Um, and we've had to do a lot of adjusting. And one of the ways we adjusted was by doing more advocacy in DC. So it was less um, our community organizing efforts domestically uh, here in LA were much um, 
we took a real back seat to the work we began doing, particularly with the Rohingya and the Uyghur populations, and we were able to get uh, more involved with those populations because we had more time, because we weren't doing our local organizing. Is that Sheila? Oh, I have a question from something you said be, uh, er, much earlier. You said the uh, solar thing stopped after 10 years. Why did they stop? Okay, so it has to do, that's a great question. It was heartbreaking for us because it was such an integral part of our work and it, it was an organizing tool for us here. So what happened in the refugee camps in, Ch in Chad, those refugees got to Chad by foot from Darfur in 2003. Well, by 2010, they were considered old refugees that were supposed to have adapted to wherever their refugee life was going to be. That's sort of like the, the model that the UN uses when it's funding, or the World Food Program uses when it's planning how much food to give to whom. Because they figure once you've been there for seven, eight years, you become part of some kind of an economy. Well, it happens that in these areas, there's no economy because it's all sand and no people live there. There's one little river, which is dry a lot of the time. There's some bushes next to the river. And for hundreds and hundreds of miles, there's nothing. So it was very difficult for these refugees to do what refugees are supposed to do in other settings. In addition, when, the Iran, when all the refugees, there were millions of new refugees about 10 years ago um, as a result of mostly in the Middle East. And the Syrian refugee population, I think it was like 2 million refugees fled out of Syria. So there began to be the same budget to allocate to massively, hu uh, massively increased numbers of refugees. So what they do is the longer refugees, longer term refugees get less. So it forced, and how does this all relate to solar cookers? It forced the people in the refugee camp to, to travel. They had to travel 100 miles, 200 miles, they had to take their families and travel out of the camp for weeks at a time. Um, and so the solar cooker project was gutted because they all had to go figure out how they're going to get their food. So um, it, they dispersed. They still would have a primary residence in the camp, but they would be wandering nomadically to find opportunities. So most of our crew that were making the cookers were no longer there. And it didn't resonate with them because now they were developing new, new ways of finding food, supporting themselves, cooking for their families. I mean, it's really unfortunate because the, the, there is a huge environmental and resource problem with wood. So when they go back to, to using wood burning methods, it's very dangerous for them because there's, it's not a renewable and, and plentiful source there. So, um, but it just, it's just, it's a horrible, horrible situation. I mean, it's nothing, nothing good about it, but that was why our co solar cooker project about six or seven years ago um, had to, had to, it was no longer practical for us and we couldn't deliver what we needed to deliver to justify the project. We have two relatively new uh, youth and teen programs and hopefully they will survive. Uh, the teen ambassador program is about five or six years old. It's funded by the Federation and um, we go to a number of schools. I think we have 10 different schools involved with it, and we recruit young leaders. They go through an eight-week program of training about activism and about genocide, and then their job is to activate their campuses. It's been a very successful program. We have a waiting list of kids who want to be on it. I don't know about this year, <clears throat> because as it's much more complicated for Jews to be organizing about other people's genocides right now, and that's not only, <clears throat> not only because the Jewish students are frightened and less, um, uh, everything has changed because with, with the accusations that Israel is committing a genocide in Gaza, every single meeting would have a provocateur and it would put the children in a very, very bad situation. So um, we are redesigning our program as part of what our strategic plan is about to figure out how to deal with that. How do we deal with, we don't know how long this problem is going to last, these accusations. We don't know how long the war in Gaza is going to last. We don't know what the world reaction is going to be. We don't know what the Israeli government's going to do. We don't know anything. Um, so we need to be nimble. We need to protect our students. And we need to be sensitive to the politics on campuses. 
So we are in the middle of redesigning programs and trying to figure out what will work. The, ch the kids who had been TAP students, uh, when they got to colleges, they were interested. And we always, by the way, the Schulweiss Institute has funded college organizing for Jewish World Watch for the last 15 years or so. And we've always had a presence on e any given time. It depends where we were able to attract the right students to lead it. We've always had organizing on college campuses across the country, by the way. So now we started something called JW, a group of TAP students who went to college wanted to start on their campuses, and we started this program called JW. Sandy. Uh, all the children from the uh, California or the Los Angeles area, or are there different, uh, your uh, teens, where are they coming from? The TAP program was local because we would go to the Jewish day schools, and that's where most of the, it was funded by the LA Federation for LA teens. So, and we don't have staff, we do have a staff person who works the East, she, but m more on advocacy, not community organizing. So our only program on high school campuses was in LA, is in LA, mostly uh, at uh, De Toledo, at Milken, uh, at Akiba. We'd go to you know the local Jewish day schools that have sixth grade and up. Um, we, don't, we really don't do a lot with really kids um, before sixth grade. So now we have this program, and in your handout that you see, you, you see a description of JW. Um, 10 colleges across the, sun, across the country, and they do a Shabbaton. And um, as I said, I'm sure all of these programs will be impacted by October 7th. And I can't tell you exactly how it's gonna end up and what we're gonna do, but we're working on it. You're, this is definitely a, a transitional time. But this is just information about our TAP program, but you, you can see it on our website or you can see it in the handout. And um, these programs have been very successful. I mean, young people, you know, until October 7th, I've got to say we had a continuous stream of enthusiastic um, enthusiastic young people for whom Rabbi Schulweis's initial vision really resonated. The idea of them being able to be out there in the world worrying about other people was very satisfying to these kids and it gave them a connection to other kids on their campuses. A lot of our, uh, our um, a lot of the work we did uh, on the college campus over the year was multi-ethnic. We had a lot of Muslim Jewish connection um, and I don't know how that's gonna be playing out right now. I really can't tell you and because um, I don't have an executive director with me to report exactly what at this moment is going on, uh, I do know that we're in a time of transition and it's gonna be more complicated than it ever has been for us. This is our, basically a chart of, my, I have the wrong glasses on to see so far, of all of our, um, the places we work, the places we advocate, and our youth education program. But you can see now we, a we advocate about six different conflicts in the world. And I'll tell you more about the specific advocacy we do um, I think I'll probably focus on the Uyghurs. I, I've lost track of time. Let me just see where we're at. Oh, oh we're almost done. So, <laughs> yeah, okay, we have 20 minutes. Go ahead. Hey, just one question. I, I, I wonder if transition is the right word. Uh, I wonder if maybe it would be just temporary hold until this business in the Middle East is somehow maybe not resolved, but at least is um, tamped down so that we can think about helping other people. Because in, in, even in, in Judaism, if, uh, you're, if two people are drowning and there's only one life preserver that will help one person, you're supposed to save yourself and not save right. the other person. That's an excellent point. That's what Rabbi, Shulai, Rabbi Feinstein's advice was, because we went to him at the end of October. To, and he said, you know, spend six months suspend your programming and and let's see where it all settles down. So I, I guess I didn't really mean transition because I mean that's the dilemma. The fact is that the work is still necessary. Horrible things continue to happen in the world, not only to us, to people with far less voice and resource than us, even now in our current circumstance. So it's the last thing I wanna say is that the original vision and need is not there, but we need to adapt to the current time. And we, uh, we have more or less, I believe, suspended most of our, we haven't suspended our grants because we have commitments to the people in the places we work. 
and we have not suspended our legislative advocacy work because we're in the middle of helping to pass some really important legislation. But our community organizing, our presence on campuses, we've suspended that for now, I am sure, and we are going to see where everything comes down. We are continuing with some of our dialoguing uh, about hate. Uh, because a lot of this does, I mean, most of these conflicts, by the way, are sourced in ethnic hatred and ethnic cleansing. Almost all of them, almost all the places. In fact, I think all of them are about ethnic, either you're, you know, you may both be Muslim, but one's an Arab Muslim and one's a black Muslim. That's a division. You may, um, in China, it's the Buddhists against the Muslims. In um, the Rohingya, it's the a certain kind of Christianity against other kinds of Christians. But they always find the divisions and the people who are evil and power-seeking um, want to dominate and victimize the other. So, I mean, the, the important thing is, and I think about Rabbi Shulweis a lot these days, and I so wish he was here for so many reasons, but to get his wisdom on this, because some people would say, I mean, some of our normal supporters would say, you know, don't talk to me about it, don't ask me about it, you're done. Um, we said, well, let's just take a break. Let's take a break. Because I know that people who believed in our mission initially will believe in it again when they're not as wounded and as frightened as they are right now. Um, but, you know, we've been really careful not to, I mean, our last year's fundraising was terrible because we didn't do our normal end of year fundraising work because I knew I wasn't able to do it because I was, you know, we wanted all the money to go, the extra money we had to go um, for, for Israel at that point. And we're, we're not going to sit and compete when we are in a trauma like that. So I think your point, doctor, is extremely well taken. Yes. Um, we all understand to good alums. I think most of us here try to contribute in one way or another toward that objective. But I do have a question from you. Do we ever see any of the good work that's being done by you uh, and, and maybe other organizations that are really committed to Tukun Alum professionally? Anything percolating to the surface where you get advocacy from the groups that you're helping? That's a great question. Advocacy from the people we're helping. Well, one of our strategies, especially with the Uyghurs and the Rohingya, was to work with their diaspora communities. And so one of the main things we did when we advocated for the Uyghurs was these were people who had never advocated before. They didn't really understand the American advocacy system. So we did advocacy trainings. Like, for example, I was the person who brought a group of Uyghur um, diasporic people whose parents were in uh, refugee camps and, you know, in horrible situations in uh, northwest China to Adam Schiff's office about a year and a half ago two years ago, I think it was during COVID, um, and it was the first time he actually met a Uyghur, and they were able to tell their story and their case directly to him, and then we ended up bringing many of them to Congress to talk directly to the Congress people. And now, in fact, the Elie Wiesel Foundation had given us a grant, of, uh, it was for a big conference that was supposed to be in December that, like everything else, was postponed, um, or for now, um, it's not happening. But it was a Uyghur conference and the Uyghur diaspora community, we were co-planning it with them. So, you know, we have really done an amazing job with the Uyghur community. There aren't that many other diasporic communities, if that's what you're asking, um, domestically that have been mobilized. I mean, you don't get Darfuris in America. I mean, maybe somebody at UCLA, maybe. Um, but that, that's not a community. We are very engaged with the Congolese LA church. There's a wonderful reverend, who, Pastor Casarica, who is part of our, our Jewish World Watch community. And so he does bring us to his church, and they are somewhat involved. But most of these people are poor, struggling to make a living. And, you know, feeding their families is what they are very focused on. In a way, being able to advocate and travel back and forth to Washington, D.C. and make these impacts, it's not really something that most poor people can do. Um, it's, it's, if you think about it practically, having an advocacy organization takes money, energy, education to be able to put it all together and make an impact. But we do work with a lot of other nonprofits. Um, aside from HIAS, we've worked with Israel Aid, we've worked with um, 
Women for Women. We've worked for quite a few. Uh, we have a lot of partners in, that we've worked with over the course of time. Uh, but not, I mean, Uyghurs is the best example, and the Rohingya. There were some Rohingya um, diaspora members that were here, um, and they have been working with us as well. So, and they do come to our walk. They put together a team. I mean, there is some engagement. I wouldn't say it's dramatic, but it's there. So this is our sort of 20-year impact. Um, we've raised $32 million over the last 20 years. Nine million of it raised more than 50 different projects. For 50 different projects, we've either developed ourselves or funded. We've had 15 walks to end genocide. About 20,000 people have participated in those walks. And you know the rest, we have a lot of legislative accomplishments, some of which I've already spoken with. We've had a, a very, it's a niche organization that's really been able to make a big impact for a very small amount of dollars. That sounds like a lot, $32 million, but think about it, you know, year to year, it's a little over a million dollars. Um, it's a little over a million dollars, and half of it, or a third of it, goes to our projects, which leads us with a, you know six or $700,000 to operate that's rent and a few staff people and copy costs and a, and a website. I mean, it's, we do a lot with very uh, reasonable amount of money. Um, and the, the next part of the presentation is just, I'm, and I'm not gonna go through it in a lot of detail, but if anybody's interested, um, it really goes into the conflicts in each of the places we work. But I wanna focus on, um, I think I wanna focus on the Uyghurs and, and um, Burma, which is the Rohingya. So he, here we are. The Rohingya, or I, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced both ways. It's a Muslim ethnic minority. <clears throat> it's lived uh, in, the, in, the, in the Rakhine state of Buddhist country. Um, and it's, they've been there a long time. Uh, and they have always had problems with the host community. They've always been sort of um, the targets of a lot of racism. And just a few years ago, in 2017, you know, Burma and Myanmar, actually Myanmar is just a, another way of saying Burma. It's, it's and, and now people are back to calling it Burma. It's very political whether you call it Myanmar or Burma. The American government still calls it Burma. Um, there is um, a lot of fighting going on between the government and the uh, and, and various ethnic militia groups, and it ended up. They, I mean, of course, the government says that the that the Rohingya started it by wanting more attention to its region, more government money, more government projects. This is the story in a lot of places, and. A small militant group from the Rohingya probably did something that provoked or justified Burma's major attack in 2017, whereby uh, 700,000 um, Rohingya ended up fleeing to Bangladesh, neighboring Bangladesh. And you can see they're right next to each other. And there is the largest refugee camp in the world is in Bangladesh, full of Rohingya, I think um, they say about a million. About a million people live in this refugee camp. That's where we have an education project because what the government, is very similar to what was happening in China where the government did not want the children using, uh, taught to use their language. They were trying to force assimilate them so that they would no longer identify um, as, as Muslims and they were trying to get them to convert. So in this refugee camp, they actually forbid the Rohingya language. Um, but we were able to work with them in one of the schools, and what our project is in that country is translating materials into their language and teaching in two of the schools in, the, in Cox's Bazaar in the language uh, of the Rohingya people. And this is a very bad situation. The refugee camp is a disaster. There's no food, There's, it's just horrible. I haven't been there. Um, we had planned a trip to go there about four, in like 2020, but had to cancel it. It's pretty dangerous. Um, and they're still very much in, um, 
in conflict. They're not, it doesn't look like they're gonna be going back anytime soon to their, um, to their homes. So they're in a very bad situation as refugees and we will continue to work with them. We have a three year long grant to fund the schools that we will continue to do that work. Um, and it's, it's, our, it's our stand against the genocide because you know genocide, you can have a genocide without killing anybody. If you take children away from their parents and this is happening with the Uyghurs where they reassign uh, children to Han families and uh, try to eliminate all of the indicia of their ethnicity for the next generation. And uh, although with the Uyghurs, there have been many, some people say more than 100,000 people have been disappeared. Um, so nobody knows where they are. We have some of our uh, diaspora partners who, don't, who are trying to find their families and can't find them. Um, but the biggest problem with the Uyghurs is they're being used as forced labor. Force, and that gave us a tremendous opportunity. We can't work in China. We can't do work in China. But we can advocate for all of the exports. Uh, and that's what we did. We really connected in. You can see here just some basic statistics. Here it was, oh, 20%. I was wrong. I thought it was more. 20% of the world's cotton comes from China in the Xinjiang province. That's where the Uyghurs are, the Xinjiang province. It's also called Uyghur province. Um, and you can see that a lot of the polysilicon used in solar panels are made by Uyghur forced labor. So you have these very large forced labor uh, encampments. They're in concentration camps, more or less. Uh, not death camps, but they are forced to work. And so, uh, and you can see they've been, they had been living in this region for almost 8,000, 9,000 years. I mean, these are ancestral this is their an ancestral homeland. Um, and they are being treated terribly by um, the Chinese government. And you know, they, they advertise, they promote Uyghur, they meaning the, the Chinese government promotes Uyghur labor to companies. And the companies that are involved, um, I think I have it on the next slide, yeah. Here, Volkswagen, BMW, Hugo Boss, Adidas, and ASF. So these companies were the targets of our campaign to try to get them to stop using uh, Uyghur, the products of Uyghur forced labor. But it ended up, we were actually really successful because last year, starting I think January of this year, there is a presumption that any cotton or uh, polysilicons coming out of China in this, from this region, there's a legal presumption that they are made with Uyghur forced labor and they are banned, you're not allowed to use them. So rather than getting the companies to agree, uh, we ended up going to Congress and with the help of the Uyghur community and a large organizing effort, uh, which is why we have a staff person in New York and one staff person who goes back and forth between New York and Washington DC, we were able to get um, this legislation passed, um, which has been, I think will make a big impact. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, our, we currently, right now, have 10 projects pending. Um, and he, the projects are mostly women and children in Congo, the Rohingya children in Bangladesh, that's in, in Cox's Bazaar in the refugee camp. Um, oh, I didn't talk at all about the Syrian. Do you remember the high holiday where Rabbi, that morning of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, that little Syrian boy was washed up on the shore of I forget, Turkey or wherever the country was. Rabbi Feinstein spoke about it. And um, that civil war in Syria, which has killed millions of people, I mean, literally, I think, I forget the number, millions of people, and created a massive world refugee problem. So we got involved with an organization that was started at Stephen Wise. It was called Save the Syrian Children. And uh, this young couple was able to develop a system through their own business. When they were in college at USC, they developed you know, business promotional products, swag. They had that kind of a business. So they were having products probably made in China, I don't know where, and shipped around the world um, wherever their customers were. So they had developed ways to get things made cheaply and how to get them transported. And they decided when they heard about the Syrian civil war and all the children who were suffering, they decided to 
um, to create a project for medical supplies. They would have medical supplies uh, created somewhere cheap in the world, probably with slave labor, but I didn't ask. Um, and they would transport these medical supplies to these children uh, who were in the hospitals at the border um, near Israel. And they worked with the IDF to help get access into Syria. And we were funding and continue to fund these big crates of um, medical supplies because for $25,000 donation, we got maybe $500,000 of bandages and other kinds of products that they needed. So that's our project in Syria. Um, and then we also had, of course, when the Ukrainian situation developed, I mean, the world is so replete with problems right now. When the Ukrainian situation developed, um, we decided that we would work in Moldova also in a hospital um, with vulnerable uh, Ukrainians who could not afford their medical care. So these are the places, the kinds of things that we work on. And what I'll say in conclusion is, because we could have talked about the politics in Darfur or in Chad or in, or in uh, Congo, and we didn't, but our job in the beginning, and I continue to believe that it will be our job, is not, the world's never gonna be perfect, and right now God knows it, it's probably at one of its more imperfect points in time, but we have to do what we can to start a project, to start assistance, to show that we care. And even if we can't do everything and can't make everything better and can't solve all the problems, we do have the power to do something. And I think our organization uh, has demonstrated over the years that you can make a difference, you can actually live Torah and, uh, and make an impact on people's lives here and on the people who are suffering in the world. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for listening. And uh, to better times for all of us. <laughs>